Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, and today is January 29th, 2020. And as always, I am graciously accepting donations so that I could do things like pay the electric bill uh, and um, eat and and inconveniences like that. Um, my website is rushjournal.org. R-U-S-Journal.org, and from there, among other places, you can um, donate to my work. And I appreciate it, and as always, I thank my my donors. Um, and uh, I, you, you, you're really the only guys who, who keep me going, and I appreciate it. By the way, as an aside, you guys remember I broke the story, what was it, a year ago, nine months ago, the guy in the Perm region of Russia, um, Roman Ushkov, who was prosecuted by um, uh, Hasidic rabbis who control the local government there for so-called Holocaust denial. And they lost um, using the so-called uh, rehabilitation of Nazism or extremism law, whatever it might be. Um, and the court slapped it down Saying this does not have this has nothing to do with um, scholarly work. Scholarship can't be censored in this country. Of course, you know that kind of talk on the Holocaust is is day to day in 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 Russia. It couldn't possibly be illegal. Well, I just discovered from my friend um, Michael Walsh, who I know from the Barnes Review, that he countersued. Ushkov countersued and received fifty thousand dollars. I'm sorry, fifty thousand rubles in compensation for being falsely persecuted in connection with his um, uh, concerns on the Holocaust. Um, because they searched his house, they took his office equipment, they wiretapped his phone calls. Uh, he wasn't allowed to leave the country, stuff like that. A lot of this he didn't even know about. And he was given damages uh, by the court for that. So not only is Russia a place where scholarly work on the Holocaust can be done, but if you try to attack someone for it, you yourself will face damages. And will be, uh, the, at least now we have the, the local precedent for lawsuits against this kind of thing in, in Russia. Um, but today, I want to talk about something. I, I, I said last week I was going to talk about Angela Davis. And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to save that for next week because really I don't feel like dealing with her. Many of you know I have a special hatred for her for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and she's being worshipped. I mean, the worship uh, is, is beyond belief with this woman. Um, I'll save that for a bit later, and I want to talk about something I've been working on concerning Bloody Sunday, not not the Irish version. I'm talking about Russia's Bloody Sunday, and the Revolution of 1905. Um, one of the reasons I want to talk about this is because in my first book, The Third Rome, I didn't handle this particular issue very well. Um... My Russian language skills were weak at the time, and um, I was relying mostly on English language sources there. Remember what that book was. That book was really an outline of what my life's research agenda was going to be. That's how I viewed it at the time. It was not meant to in any way be comprehensive. It was too short for that. It was essentially an outline about how I argue things and what I was going to be doing for you know, the next 40 years. And I've stayed pretty close to that. One of the weaker parts of the book is is this Bloody Sunday issue. And I want to talk about it because it um, it's treated in every English language textbook the exact same way. It's used to exonerate the leftist revolutionaries. It's used to attack Tsar Nicholas II and his government in St. Petersburg. It is absolutely essential to the leftist mythology on all Russia. Like everything else uh, in that world, 
it's pure wishful thinking. I mean, this show has really become taking apart the leftist mythology, you know, one issue at a time, both in Russian and American uh, related issues. And we've all learned one thing, which is really hard to admit, and that is that everything of substance that the average educated American believes about the world is false. And it's hard to admit that because it means that we don't even have a foundation for a conversation with a lot of these people. We're not even defining the words the same way. And a lot of this comes from the that small cadre of, of journalists and academics who promote these, these fictions because it's easy. Leftist ideology and academic history are identical. It's one and the same thing. Or I should say academia in general. The establishment story is that Tsar Nicholas, for no reason, ordered his men to fire in a peaceful and loyal demonstration of citizens asking for basic minimum rights. And you'll notice that in leftist mythology, uh, you see this with you know, the military governments in Latin America or South Korea, Indonesia, that the bad guy in leftist mythology always acts without any reason or purpose. He kills for the sake of killing. He's brutal for the sake of brutality. They never give a reason for this. Why would these guys spend this level of effort and alienate so many people and have people hate them by killing for no good reason? And of course, no one even asked that question, let alone answers it. But the establishment myth is just that. The killings did occur, of course. And we dealt with the pogroms on this, on this program and elsewhere where, of course, for the most part, it was the Orthodox who suffered far more than, than the Jewish population. The Jewish population was very well armed, and um, probably better armed than, than the police or even, even the army was at the time. Um, but as far as Bloody Sunday is concerned, it took place on January 9th, 1905, in St. Petersburg. And I have a Soviet-era Russian language textbook, and this is how it describes it. Hundreds of thousands of workers in the capital, desperate from lawlessness and poverty, indignant at the surrender of Port Arthur, on a winter Sunday with wives and children, with icons, banners, and royal portraits, with the singing of prayers and the hymn God Save the Tsar, peacefully, with an expression of loyal feelings, processed to the palace square to tell Emperor Nicholas II about their needs, and hope that their father Tsar will protect them from the arbitrariness of capitalists and manufacturers. Rather, the government ordered their execution, spilling streams of innocent blood. More than 4,600 people were killed and wounded on that day. That, that is the historical equivalent of the F word. It, 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 not, not a syllable of that is true. 4,600, I don't know how they came to such a, a specific number. Um, but that's, of course, not even close to the, to the total. Tsar Nicholas would have to be insane, and I mean that clinically, to shoot loyal supporters, or to order the shooting of loyal supporters. It doesn't make any sense, and as always, if it doesn't make any sense, it's usually not true. Well, none of these demonstrators ever actually reached the palace. They came from numerous angles, um, the Petrograd and, and Vyborg side and the uh, Fontanka, those who came from the Narva, uh, um, the Narva outpost in the Schüsselsberg Highway. So there was more than one procession. And really it was only on Veseleski Island where you had a real pitched battle between revolutionaries and, and uh, guards and soldiers. They had actually created you know, barricades and even pillboxes and they had planned a violent overthrow of the state using the war of Japan as a pretext. And we dealt with the Russo-Japanese War in one and a half episodes. So these are connected. They used the Japanese War as a pretext um, for what became known through the revolution of 1905-1906. Uh, some call it the First Russian Revolution. Though, frankly, the First Russian Revolution was Peter the Great. Um, and by the way, I'm working on reconstructing some of his rituals to the god Bacchus, who was his patron god, and he had a, a whole ritual um, 
a set of rituals drawn up for his extraordinary drunken synod that he created as a mockery of the church. And I'll be presenting that one of these days, although it's very unpleasant to even think about some of the things that he did. But Bloody Sunday used the Japanese war as a pretext in the sense that the press was reporting this war as a loss, as a slaughter. And it was because of the incompetence of the, of the czarist um, military command that, that it happened. People who listen to this show are well aware that that is not the, not the case at all. But they needed that. You know, leftist revolution needs warfare. I mean, World War I, of course, led to the overthrow of monarchies all over the place. In America, it was a Vietnam War. For 1905, although abortive, um, it was the war with Japan. And in most of these cases, it's misreporting of the war, a deliberate misreporting of the war, so as to give aid and comfort to the left. Because without lies, without mythology, you can't be a leftist. Now, newspapers in the capital, the following day, January 10th, simply invented the story from whole cloth. Early on, they had one source, and that was a leaflet that was distributed um, in the early morning of January 9th in St. Petersburg. And we know this because it uses the phrase, thousands of workers executed on the palace square. And that line was precisely in these news stories. And that was used all over Russia and eventually all over Europe. Of course, the question presents itself, but how could it have been possible to publish that on the day after it occurred, since no one was working on Sunday then? Not to mention the printing presses were all on strike at the time. That means that the leaflet was made in advance on the 8th. In other words, a day before the march occurred. So before the march occurred, they were passing out leaflets saying that they were going to be killed the next day. Thousands and thousands executed. Well, the final tally is that 96 were killed. Uh, and, and that includes policemen and, and palace guards. And there were 311 wounded. Now, we've already dealt with the Japanese war. Um, we know that they attacked Russia without declaring war. We know that they were built up militarily by the British and to a lesser extent the Americans. And we know that the Russian press, or actually the world press, was saying how badly the Russians were defeated. We know that that's not the case. Um, but one thing to, to take from the Japanese war is that, and you can say this is similar with the U.S. and the Vietnam War too, is that Japan was mobilized at 100% of its potential. It couldn't possibly spend another yen on uh, military or, or, or government spending. It was at its full maximum potential. They were drafting guys in their 50s as that war came to an end. On the other hand, the internal life of Russia really wasn't affected at all. And there was some increase in spending. There was a small loan taken out, but it really didn't, didn't matter. The state bank didn't stop the exchange of, of notes for gold for a single day. And the harvest of 1904 was plentiful. Industry in increased its production, but only part of that was because of the increase in military orders. And you also, as we all know, saw this continuous increase in wages, but not just in the defense industry, but all over the place. That labor, the peasantry, were doing very well at the time, certainly relative to, to Europe. The increased military spending was covered mostly from the Treasury, but there were some very short-term loans. Um, we mentioned also that, that Russia was borrowing money at, you know, 5%, and Japan had to pay far higher, almost 10% in some, some cases. And as always, Russia maintained a very positive trade balance. Um, and besides all that, you know, Japan was fighting in its own backyard in areas that it knew very, very well. This area, of course, to Russia was relatively new and unexplored and very lightly populated. Uh, and as time went on, of course, the Russians supported the Chinese, while the British and the Americans supported the Japanese. 
once the Manchu dynasty fell. And we've also talked about the Opium Wars on this show, and that's part of the reason why. China disintegrated until uh, Mao took over in 1949. The other thing to know about the Japanese war is to what extent the revolutionaries were explicitly viewing themselves as assisting the Japanese war effort. And the newspaper Liberation, which was the organ of the Union of Liberation, we read, If Russian troops defeat the Japanese, which in the end is not as impossible as it seems at first glance, then freedom will be quietly strangled to the cries of cheers and the ringing of the triumphant empire. Only large-scale sabotage in the rear of the fighting Russian army, only internal unrest in Russia could prevent such an outcome of the war. This was the only chance for Japan and for the revolution. People talk about the big bankers financing the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. That's all true. Almost everyone talks about the German government supporting the, the leftists. That's also true. No one talks about the Japanese supporting the leftists in this period of time. The former military attaché in St. Petersburg, Colonel Amato Akashi, made contact with Lenin in 1904. So this is actually, you know, just as the war begins, or even a bit before. Through the terrorist Vera Zasulich, uh, who I've dealt with also before. And he said to the revolutionaries, he said, we are ready to help you financially by acquiring weapons, but more importantly, to prevent the movement, your movement, that is a revolutionary movement, from cooling down and thereby introducing into Russian society an element of constant excitement, a protest against the government. So he began meeting with different leftist groups. This Japanese uh, attaché had a plan to organize armed rebel groups uh, of up to 100,000. The Japanese government, through Akashi, gave the left 750,000 yen, which in 1904, the exchange rate was for like $1 to, to 2 yen. So it's quite a bit of money. Only after World War II did the exchange rate become as unbalanced as it still is today. In other words, the Japanese made a huge investment in the Russian revolutionary movement in this period of time. Uh, George Dekanozov, who became a, a favorite of Stalin later on, received 125,000 francs for travel abroad. One of the main agents for Akashi was a Finnish revolutionary, Kani um, Vilikus, and it was through him that Japanese money was distributed uh, among the revolutionary elites in, in Russia. Now, Russian intelligence at the time reported, um, and they found a, a, a cache of, of papers in Finland, um, 8,000 rifles had been delivered to the Finnish nationalists, 5,000 rifles to the Georgians, 1,000 to the social revolutionaries, 8,000 to other socialist parties, and another 500 Mausers for distribution between Finnish nationalists and the social revolutionaries. So with Japanese money, two clandestine factories were built in Finland, and this is where they were getting many of the, much of their weaponry and their bombs. Uh, and of course, American millionaires donated huge amounts of cash for subversive work in, in Russia. Most of you know about Jacob Schiff. But the total amount of foreign money allocated in Russia amounted to about $50 million then. And it, it's, it's odd, the, the revolution, they don't even try to hide that the so-called first Russian revolution was made with the money from capitalists and millionaires abroad. Um, Boris Savinkov, a social revolutionary, writes in his memoirs in 1917, he says, A member of the Finnish Resistance Party, Kanis Ilikus, told the Central Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Party that through a donation from the American millionaires in the amount of one million francs came to the Russian Revolution. The Jewish Americans set the condition for this money that it go to the arming of a militia and be distributed among all revolutionary factions. The Central Committee accepted this amount by subtracting 100,000 francs for a combat organization. Um, so the intelligentsia of Russia really was, was begging for a defeat, very much like the American situation in, in Vietnam. Um, and the press, of course, was the main organ here. To be a patriot, 
concerning this war was to be kicked out of polite society. Um, and the found is, is when the Union of Liberation was founded. Um, and among its original members, you had 32 chairmen of the provincial administration and seven provincial representatives of the nobility. The Union of Liberation, who had a terrorist wing, had many local elites as a part of it. As always, these leftist groups have very, very few peasants or workers. In fact, they really look down on those people. Um, they're anti-nationalists, of course, but they wanted to use the right of self-determination for nations as a way to break the Russian Empire apart. Um, so these leftist forces took part in a meeting of all different revolutionary factions uh, over September, October 1904 in Paris, uh, which was organized by the Japanese and Japanese and British money. Remember, the, the relationship between Japan and Britain was very close. So you had both England and Japan financing the revolution. And actually, much of the money coming from Tokyo uh, into Finland uh, was British in the first place. So you had Polish, Latvian, Finnish, Armenian, Georgian, and of course Jewish nationalists were represented in this Congress. So you had both socialist and nationalist branches of the anti-Russian forces. And the nationalists are nationalists, you know, so to speak. They're, of course, civic nationalists using ethnicity just as a prop because they knew it was popular. The Paris meeting passed a resolution on the annihilation of autocracy and the creation of a free democratic system based on universal suffrage as its main demand. But they also realized, and they stated very clearly, that Russia's defeat in the war with Japan was useful for the cause of liberation. And after the meeting in Paris, all these factions, flush with cash, far more money than the right wing had in Russia, um, started, started to work on, on um, the violent overthrow of the state. The hard part about this was that Russia was doing so well. Textbooks won't tell you this, but Russia was growing at a gigantic clip, very much like Prussia and Germany at the time. Well, both East and West, Western Germany. Uh, growing at a tremendous uh, tr tremendous rate, both not only in terms of the e e economy, but also in population. Um, and so the Union of Liberation uh, engaged, they had a banquet campaign for elites throughout the country. Uh, 34 cities, 120 meetings and rallies um, were held. And of course, this was all quite legal. Um, but the revolutionaries also began to prepare for armed action. The legal rallies, where you had all the nobles getting together, trying to limit royal power or something like that, um, were just a front. The main faction, of course, concerned itself with St. Petersburg. Um, the Assembly of Russian Factory Workers in St. Petersburg, which was a legal group created in February of 1904, um, had about 20,000 members in the capital by 1905. And, of course, you had the authorities themselves participating in this workers' organization. Workers had strong unions at the time, both traditional and, and new. Uh, and it was from Tsar Nicholas that they received the, the ability to, um, to organize, actually Alexander III also. Um, but the assembly defended the rights of its members, uh, abolished all kinds of illegal fines and, and, and dismissals. You already had a very strict um, uh, a labor code in Russia, far stricter than anywhere else. Um, and this group, of course, you know, we call it police socialism. This was a meant to be anyway, a, a loyal labor union. Uh, and one of the members of this labor union, of course, was Father George Gapon, who most of you have heard of him before, who became infamous for leading the procession that um, led to um, Bloody Sunday. He began with this legal, even government-sponsored labor union, uh, which was actually quite successful, and slowly became radicalized over time. Labor was generally royalist in one form or another. And they didn't like it when any of these unions began speaking in Republican terms. They had enough common sense to know that Republicanism means money. 
you know, they considered the, the British model to be an oligarchy. Um, but Capone, if he was going to continue to function in this union, there was an illegal underground branch. And the petition that this march was going to bring to the Tsar had its exoteric side, which was, you know, freedom of speech and press, which existed anyway. Amnesty for so-called political prisoners and everything else. Um, but there was an esoteric element. And that was, of course, the revolutionary struggle. Um, Gapon and the revolutionaries um, were led, to some extent, by Pincus Rutenberg, uh, who used a number of pseudonyms in his career. Uh, in fact, it was it was Rutenberg who had radicalized Gapon. We're preparing for a bloody provocation. On December 20th, Port Arthur is said to have fallen. Now, we've spoken about that at some length. Um, and the newspaper Our Days said, the miserable remnants of the victorious legions laid down their arms at the feet of the victor. This was undisguised gloating. Um, and most of the foreign-funded leftists spoke like this, that the Russian army was pathetic and they deserved to die. But they needed a pretext. But the state-sponsored labor union this was created uh, under the Moscow Security Department, um, SV Zubatov, and so-called police socialism, the Society of Russian Factory Workers. And, you know, Gopon was, was a member... On the one hand, he did devote himself to caring for the poor, and he did he was respected among them. And early on, when this was founded, he was a royalist. He said monarchy does not contradict the demands of the workers. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, but when Zubantov left the scene, he wrote, and this is Gopon writing here, with the disappearance of Zubantov, the St. Petersburg Organization of Workers remained in an uncertain position. So when in August 1903, a deputation of five representatives of the secret committee came to me with a request to take matters into my own hands, I agreed. Now, that means, uh, well, the, the, one of the original pretexts was the um, Putilov factory, where Rutenberg worked as an engineer, it was one of the first, well, it was the beginning of this series of strikes that eventually paralyzed the country over the Japanese war. Several members of Gapon's uh, society were dismissed. Because of that, the general strike began, eventually reaching almost 150,000 workers in, in Petersburg. Gapon launched into a stormy agitation among the workers, and he persuaded them to create this procession that was going to bring their demands to the sovereign directly. Um, Rutenberg was a man who wrote the petition with all of these requirements. December 27th, 1904, just before the procession in Bloody Sunday, um, they had several meetings and very provocative resolutions were, were adopted, not just for the plant, but for the city as a whole. And the point is that it became radical enough that they knew it could never possibly be accepted. Many of the demands would not be made public, but in the fifth paragraph of that resolution, it says, if these legitimate demands of the workers are not met, the union resigns itself to any violence and disturbance in the capital. In other words, we can't be held responsible for what happens as a result. Um, and of course, the Pulitov factory directorate um, refused their demands, and the strike started on January 3rd. Um, so the Pulitov factory... Uh, really, it, it, it amounted to almost 13,000 men. Then you'll book of Inesky plants, another 26,000. Um, very early January, uh, you had numerous other plants. The Franco-Russian shipyard, um, the Minkowski plant, um, and that, that, you know, the Minkowski factories had 14,000 workers. These were, these were the big businesses of the day. Then, um, 
Metropolitan Anthony of St. Petersburg on the 5th of January. So this is, you know, right, right before everything. Um, called him for a meeting because now he's, he's starting to um, cross the line here. He's starting to cross the line into blatantly political organization that has a very anti-royalist bent to it. And I should note that Father George had been married twice. There are exceptions to that rule among the priesthood if under very certain circumstances, if you could demonstrate that you've been abandoned, not necessarily divorced. So it, it, he's, he's, a, he's a relatively rare case. You see it more in Romania, but he, he was permitted to marry a second time um, in, in, issues, in cases of abandonment or um, apostasy, which really amounts to the same thing. But on the night of the 6th of January, he fled from his house and was essentially de facto defrocked. So the first week of January, um, you had initially 40,000 men on strike, and then it became well over 100,000 in a very short period of time. Now, during the blessing of the water uh, in the Neva, in front of the Winter Palace, one of the guns of the battery, that they, they had the, the salute of the guns, and it fired at a, straight, a very strange angle, almost directly upwards. And large missiles then fell on the pavilion and the facade of the Winter Palace. In the gazebo where they were, there were about five, um, essentially, you know, cannonballs. One of which fell very close to the sovereign. One par- a palace guard was injured. General um, A. A. Mosolov, who was uh, head of the Ministry of the Imperial Court, said that this was no accident. He thought it was an assassination attempt. Uh, by at least one soldier of the guard. Um, and after that, um, Tsar Nicholas, assured that it was an isolated event, left the palace and, in fact, um, left with his family um, uh, and, and left St. Petersburg. But given this situation, you would think that the, the Gopan would cancel the procession because Nicholas wasn't going to be there. But that wasn't the issue. In fact, it was in his interest for Tsar Nicholas not to be there. He didn't tell anybody that he wasn't going to be there. Um, he was the first one to, to speak of bloodshed. He said, if the soldiers shoot at us, we will resist. The socialist revolutionaries promised bombs. He knew that the Tsar wasn't going to be there, but if soldiers shot at him, he could blame him. He could blame the Tsar directly. Um and he met with the Union of, Union of Liberation uh, delegation. And of course, to put it nicely, he wouldn't rule out the possibility of, of shooting on, uh, open, open, opening fire on, on the guards there. Uh, and he was involved with numerous factions of the revolutionary movement. As the, you know, the war is dragging on, um, Port Arthur fa- f- falls. This is a proper time to do this. You know, the iron is, is, is hot. This is time to strike. Um, and as I said, labor had nothing to do with this. No worker had any part in the writing of these petitions. Gapon distributed a, a leaflet to the crowd that was eventually going to march on the capital that said, Freedom is bought with blood. Freedom is won with guns in our hands in fierce battles. Do not ask the king or even demand from him anything. We will not humiliate ourselves before our sworn enemy, but throw him off the throne, down with the autocracy, to arms, my comrades. And this was posted all over the city before the march began. The 7th of January, 105,000 people were on strike in the city. It's The uh, RSDLP sent its best agitators to all departments of the assembly of the Russian factory workers. What this amounts to is that this initial, really a National Socialist labor union, in other words, it was both patriotic and anti-capitalist, um, was taken over by the left. What had been an excellent idea that had done some good work 
was taken over by very well-funded leftist revolutionaries. Gopon continued to say, if they beat us, we will answer the same. There will be victims. There will be blood. We will arrange barricades, smash gun shops, break up the prison, take the phone, the telegraph. We will make a revolution. So, in that final meeting, he said this, it's decided that tomorrow we're going, we're going, we're going to process. Don't put your red flags up so as not to give our demonstration a revolutionary character. If you want, go ahead of the procession. When I get to the Winter Palace, I will take with me two flags, one white, the other red. If the sovereign accepts a deputation, I'll announce it with a white flag. If he does not, I'll show the red one. And then you can throw up your red flags and do your best. He asked them if they had any weapons. The Social Democrats had firearms. And that's when Gapon launched the plan to shoot at least some of the uh, troops there and create a false massacre. Um, workers that were part of this union were loyal. They were monarchists. And that's why there was an exoteric and an esoteric petition. Um, and it, part, part of it read like this. Let everyone be equal and free in the right of being elected. And a constituent assembly should be convened subject to a universal secret and equal vote. This is our most important request. But one measure cannot heal our wounds and others are needed. The immediate release and return of all victims for political convictions. Immediate declaration of freedom of speech, press, and freedom of assembly. The responsibility of ministers to the people and the guarantee of the rule of law of government. Separation of church and state. So, at the very last minute, instead of simply economic demands that the workers did support, this esoteric petition appears um, containing these kind of demands, that these were revolutionary demands. The fact that there were so many leftist newspapers and rallies shows you there was full freedom of speech. There was full freedom of press. The leftists outpublished the right all over the place. And there was freedom of assembly. Of course, wartime was another matter. But the point was to create a provocation. The left has been doing this since, since the British Revolution. They need to provoke people into shooting so it could justify their own violence. So the workers in the legal labor unions were generally royalists, and many of them were doing quite well, did have specific demands, um, especially when the war ended. They were given these very limited demands, and this is what they were told they were going to talk about. But they were lied to. The esoteric petition was not released to them. In fact, Gopon went so far as to say that the Tsar himself was going to come out and meet them. And he forged the Tsar's words. This actually has happened many times in, in Russian history. This is what he said, Tsar Nicholas said to him. I, the Tsar of God, am powerless to cope with officials and elites. I want to help my people, but the nobles do not. Rise, Orthodox. Help me, your king. Defeat my and your enemies. And this actually comes from the Bolshevik uh, al Subotin. So the point was, of course, to use the crown and the loyalty of the people to start a revolution. The Bolsheviks did this after World War I, or during World War I, claiming that the Tsar and, and, and his wife were pro-German, and therefore using Russian patriotic attitudes against them. Um, but Gapan knew, in other words, what was going to happen. The night before the rally, he said, if they don't let us pass, we will break through by force. If they shoot at us, we'll defend ourselves. Part of the army will go, lo go over to our side, and then we will arrange a revolution. We will create barricades, smash weapon stores, everything else. Uh, I've quoted uh, the rest of it already. And that comes from the Iskra demonstration uh, number 86. Um, we report from the government. So the ninth comes around and you have hundreds of thousands ready to leave for a meeting with the Tsar. A lot of them are convinced that he was there and was dying to meet them. Obviously, it's impossible to cancel at this point. Hundreds of agitators, well-trained, were going through the crowds, agitating for more radical um, ideas, trying to pick out who was more radical. 
And, and they were deliberately creating the notion that the Tsar was going to be there and they were going to meet with him and they were going to be, you know, uh, heard directly. Um, now, the authorities did issue an announcement because much of this was leaked to them. But only one printing house worked. This, there were strikes all over the city. The government did try to warn the population about this, but the circulation was too small. Um, so he says, again, the day before the, the uh, march, Gopon writes to, um, to the Minister of Interior. He says, Your Excellency, workers and residents of Petersburg must see the Tsar this January, Sunday at 2 p.m. in the Palace Square to express directly his needs, the needs of the entire people. The Tsar has nothing to fear. I, representative of the Assembly of Russian Factory Workers of Petersburg, my colleagues, the workers, even so-called revolutionary groups of different directions, guarantee the invulnerability of his person. Let him go forth as a true king, with a courageous heart to his people, and take the petition from our hands. The benefit of the inhabitants of Petersburg require it. Otherwise, the end of the moral connection that still exists between the Russian Tsar and the Russian people will be broken. Your duty, a great moral duty to the crown and the entire Russian people, is today to bring to the attention of His Imperial Highness all the above in our petition attached here. Tell the Tsar that I, the workers of many thousands of the Russian people, peacefully, with faith in him, decided to go to the Winter Palace. May he react with confidence in us, his people. A copy of this document of a moral nature has been taken down and will be brought to the attention of the entire Russian people. Signed, Father George, upon January 8th, 1905. He knew, and of course this was, this was circulated amongst the crowd, he knew that this was a deception. He knew this arm wasn't there. He knew that he was planning violence. He knew that this, the leaders of this were far more radical than the workers thought they were. He knew that they were going to be armed. And that letter that I just wrote you was really an ultimatum. Because, of course, Russian, certainly Russian clergy, don't speak to the Tsar that way. Um, they were planning on killing uh, the Tsar if possible, or at least his ministers, whoever was present. Now, we could take a different look at the events of Bloody Sunday. This is not going to be found in any English language uh, textbook. The entire thing, as always, was based on deceit and psychological manipulation. The point was to provoke the soldiers to shoot, which would then fuel the indignation of those gathered at the palace. Even though Capon knew the Tsar wasn't there, you had leftist terrorists who thought he was, and you had an assassination squad that was along with one of the columns. So, there were 11 assembly points in the city, and Gapon himself went to the um, the Narva outpost. It was one of the largest uh, groups of, of workers who were con- going to converge from different parts of, of the city and move into the palace square. He didn't serve liturgy, even though this was a Sunday. He began um, the march. In his memoirs, George, Father George says this, I thought it would be nice to give the whole demonstration a religious character and immediately sent several workers to the nearest church for banners and images that refused to give them to us. So I sent a hundred men to take them by force and a few minutes later they brought them to me. Then I ordered them to take royal portrait uh, from the nearest church to emphasize the peaceful and decent character of our procession. So when you hear the slogan that this was a loyal procession with icons and banners, they stole them. They ripped them out of the church by force. The local Orthodox churches had a feeling they knew what was going on here. And it was a disguise. I'm willing to say that the bulk of the people there were loyal, decent people. But unfortunately, loyal, decent people don't make history. They maintain healthy societies, but they don't make history. Fanatical minorities do. That's all it takes in this particular case uh, to provoke a confrontation with the authorities, even though workers had women and children with them and they knew some of them would be killed. Well, the total number of participants is about 300,000. This is a huge mass moved towards the square and the closer it got, the more the, the revolutionary provocateurs 
did their work. And one of the things that they said, they were spreading rumors of mass executions that were starting to happen. Because again, this is a long procession. People in the middle and the rear had no idea what was going on in front. And they were already being told that horrible things were going to happen. Um, now, the police were not about to stop this. But the violence initially was these policemen being attacked by leftists when they were just simply trying to keep order. Um, and then the march from the Narva outpost, led by Gapon himself, shouted, if we are refused, we will no longer have a czar. And it was only at the bypass channel where a group of soldiers blocked their path. Um, they demanded that the, the procession stop, but it didn't, because those in the rear couldn't hear. The first shots definitely came from leftists in the crowd. And the policemen that were um, escorting the group, because they couldn't stop them, there's too many people, were the first to be shot. Most of the people in front were going to turn back, but Gopon insisted to go forward, and he pulled the crowd along with him. The police escorting the procession were killed. They posed no threat to anybody. On the Petrograd side, uh, provocative shots rang out from the crowd. Troops shot in the air first. They offered another warning. They shot more times in the air. War gunfire comes from the crowd, and they were forced to shoot at the gunmen and their human shields. Certain parts of the procession had knocked down telephone poles to barricade the streets. Two gun shops and a police station were destroyed, and attempts were made to break open the prison and the telegraph office and free all the prisoners, which was a typical uh, revolutionary idea. Um, and of course, the, the troops that were there were unprepared to counter this. Many of them were under the impression that this was a, a perfectly harmless thing, despite the size of it. They had to make a decision on the spot. Um, but right from the very beginning, in the Viborg Bi side, the Schisselberg side, red banners were all over the place. It didn't take very long for the icons to disappear and the red banners to, to come out. Um, one group was led by the Bolshevik uh, L.D. Davadov, who captured the Shaf weapons factory. He used about 200 men to break into the factory. It was a Sunday. No one was there. And they began arming their men. Um, the head of the police department in that particular part of Petersburg, Lepukin, who wasn't entirely unsympathetic, um, he wrote, Crowds of people, not subject to the usual general police measures and even cavalry attacks, stubbornly sought access to the Winter Palace and then, irritated by resistance, began to attack military units. This state of affairs led to the need for emergency measures to establish order, and the military organization had to act against the huge mass of men with firearms. And he means that people in the crowd had firearms. He wrote, Capon wrote, to soldiers and officers, who killed their innocent brothers, wives, and children, and all oppressors of the people, my pastoral curse. Soldiers who will help the people achieve freedom, my blessing. He then claimed that the Tsar was a traitor, and that he personally ordered the shooting. But he knew that was a lie. Um, St. Petersburg Governor General, uh, which, by the way, was a new position created right after this, was filled by D.F. Trino, who established uh, was given extraordinary powers. And in a short time, he established order in the city. Every day, he had meetings with uh, man manufacturers, representatives of labor, different sections of the population. And he did show tremendous firmness, but he was able to finally clamp down on the violence. Um, and so from the violence of the 9th um, to the 14th, roughly to the 14th, order was restored and the strikes began to finally Subside. On the 17th of January, the um, Plutusky plant resumed operation. And on the 29th of January, a commission was founded to find uh, the reasons for this discontent and to eliminate them in the future. And very shortly, a complete pacification of labor unrest was achieved. And that ended, therefore, the first pre-planned bloody anti-Russian revolution that was called the First Russian Revolution. 
Tsar Nicholas learned of this. He was not in the city at the time. But typical of him, he wanted to avoid any kind of emotional assessment. He wrote in his diary uh, that evening, on the 9th, he writes, This has been a very, very difficult day. Serious disturbances took place in St. Petersburg due to the workers' desire to reach the winter's pa- Winter Palace. The troops had to shoot in different places of the city. There were many killed and wounded. Lord, how painful and difficult. On the 19th, Tsar Nicholas had allocated 50,000 rubles from his personal funds to help the victims. And it came to, um, depending on, on the salary scale, between six months and 18 months earnings for each one from the Tsar's personal funds. Um, and he wrote also, Tsar Nicholas wrote in his diary, regrettable events with the sad but inevitable consequences of the unrest came from the fact that you let yourself be deceived and deceived by the traitors and enemies of our country. Inviting you to go to submit a petition to me about your needs, they raised rebellion against me and my government, forcibly tearing you all from honest work at a time when all truly Russian people should work together and unceasingly work to overcome our stubborn external enemy. Of course, he's referring to the Japanese war. The sin of the church wrote in the 14th, it's most unfortunate that the unrest that occurred was caused by bribery of the enemies of Russia, by the enemies of Russia, and of any public order. Significant funds were sent to them in order to inflict civil strife in our country, in order to distract workers from labor, to prevent the timely dispatch of naval and ground forces to the Far East, to impede the supply of the army in force, and thereby bring untold calamity to Russia. So the Senate of Bishops took the position that this was a, a about giving the victory to Japan. This was about destroying um, the possibility of Petersburg to supply the army in the Far East, shutting down the factories, etc. And thereby, uh, if the war then is lost, Russia humiliated, the revolution is, is going to be that much easier. Um, and um, But very soon, Gapon, that name, became a household name in Russia. And after the killings, he fled abroad. But that fall, he returned to Russia in repentance. And as a repentant man, he began to expose revolutionaries in print. He became an informer. The St. Petersburg Security Department head, uh, A.V. Gerasimov, says in his own memoirs that Gapon told him about the plan to kill the Tsar when he went out to the people and several uh, of his travels. He traveled all over the country. And Gapon said, yes, that is right. It would be terrible if this plan came true. I found out about it much later. It was not my plan, but Rutenberg. The Lord saved him. He wasn't just talking about Bloody Sunday. He was talking about um, terrorist plots on the Tsar's life afterwards. March 28, 1906. Gapon, by the decision of the Central Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, was executed by the same Rutenberg in the village of Ozerki. Um, according to a Jewish source in the Jewish press, Rutenberg, after that, passed the right of return to, to, to Judaism in, in, in Italy in 1915. Um, he became close to Jakobinsky, then to a Weizmann and Ben-Gurion, and then participated in the attempt to organize the Jewish Legion. In 1922, he moved to Palestine for the rest of his life. So it seems that Father Gapon died in repentance and was murdered by the left um, as a result of his ex- his exposing um, the terrorists to, to the state. But at the time of the shootings, the Russian financial situation fell drastically. Um, the violence was constant. The terrorism was everywhere. Um, the so-called Financial Manifesto was, was published by eight Petersburg newspapers. And that was the left's, left's call to withdraw deposit from savings banks and demand wages in hard currency and not to pay taxes. Um, and so not only was the violence destroying confidence in the system, where you had thousands and thousands of executions by leftist revolutionaries in this period of time, um, but um, 
And of course, most of you know Alexander Gelfand, who went by the pseudonym Parvus, uh, and he is the author of the Financial Manifesto, who was very destructive, which was actually very destructive in the conditions of, of, of Tsarist Russia during the war with Japan. The claim, of course, was that the, the Tsar was deliberately losing the war. This had the same thing in, in World War I, and therefore stop paying taxes and pull all your money from the banks and don't invest in Russian enterprises because the system's going to fall soon anyway. But Parvis received two million pounds from the Japanese. That was his first deposit. And he became the leader of the 1905 revolution. And Lenin even mentioned the importance of Japanese money at the Third Congress of the State Social Democratic Labor Party in the Vaporod newspaper. And it was Parvis who created the idea of the permanent revolution, not Trotsky. Um, Parvis' whole notion was to try to find the, the financial divisions in society that could be exploited for the sake of revolution. And his view was that the revolution occurs only in St. Petersburg. That will mean the revolution will occur all over Russia. The outskirts will then be destroyed afterwards. Um, in 1905, he was 36, and Bronstein, or of course Trotsky, was 10 years younger. And so Parvis became the, the kind of the mentor of, of Trotsky when he was in his 20s. And much of his ideological system came from uh, Parvis. And the notion of the continuous revolution on a global scale came from uh, Alexander Gelfand. And these men were millionaires because of money that initially came from um, American Jews and then the Japanese, and a few years later from the Germans. So to summarize, a substantial part of the Russian army was sent to the Far East. And because of that, the left thought that this was a proper time for a revolution. They were armed with money from the Rothschild clan and, and the Japanese to organize riots and strikes. And they did bribe local authorities to neutralize them. Uh, by the beginning of 1905, many of the most important regions of Russia, complete chaos and lawlessness, ruled everywhere. The railway stopped working. And it was so bad that even the emperor himself could only uh, be reached um, through horseback, on horseback. Now, because Russia was at war, most European countries would have executed these guys. It's one thing to have a demonstration in peacetime, but in wartime it's a different story. But they got away with it because local authorities didn't have very much power. Remember, police officers per capita um, were the lowest in Russia and all of Europe. Ten times less than the United States. Uh, bureaucrats per capita were the lowest in Europe. Paris had more bureaucrats than Petersburg. Um, many of the policemen couldn't even patrol properly unless there was an army of them. And that culminated in the Bloody Sunday uh, killings. And although order was restored by the end of the month, terrorism didn't disappear. Knowing full well that there was no czar in the city, this march under the laws of war were prohibited. Military patrols tried to stop them. Pre-planned shots rang out, generally with revolvers so they could be hidden, and police and the guards were forced to return fire. Uh, Gapon promised the czar inviolability, but he himself knew exactly what was going on. And when he came back to Russia in repentance, he admitted all of this. He knew they would be armed. He knew that there were criminal forces behind him. He knew that the legitimate labor union had been taken over. And he also know, knew that there was an, they were going to try to kill the czar himself. He knew all the icons and the, and the portraits were, were phony. As he wrote, as I've, I've, I've read to you, he wrote that at the time, he wrote that later. The Veseleski Island was a full-fledged pitched battle uh, during Bloody Sunday. They had full military um, barricades and even trenches under the red flag. Uh, and one of the things that they did was to spread rumors. Spreading rumors about mass executions, about um, not even that the Tsar would do these things, but rumors that the, the nobility were there was going to shoot them all and you need to defend yourself. Um, and 
even though the procession was illegal during wartime, um, the police and authorities of the city fully accepted it and was willing to even uh, escort it so long as order was kept. And the men who were escorting it were killed. They were the first to be killed, in fact. This was all prearranged. And, of course, the bribery of local officials, I'm talking about you know, your beat cops, your, your you know, lieutenants, uh, hasn't been dealt with um, uh, at any really at any level of detail. Uh, and this was all done knowing full well the women and children were in the crowd. They knew exactly what was going to happen. And um, as always, this is this this sacred event and leftist history is a total fraud, based on complete deceit, based on lies and mythology. That's now being taught as fact uh, to American university students everywhere. And that is a so-called Bloody Sunday. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.